percentage of designers that their segue into design is through music. Like it's the first sort of, you know, at least for like us, like pre-digital, maybe pre-MP3 like generation where we experience the packaging of music as much as we experience the audio. Right. Like they have the same relevant, you know, um, relationship to us as for like purchasing or remembering. It's like, it definitely was, I like to think of it like album packaging is like my gateway drug into design. Like right. that's what got me hooked. You know, that's as soon as I was, uh, I mean, even when I was a kid, like I would be like, before I was buying music, like parents' records, like I would just look through them and just be like, wow, this is amazing. Like, what the hell is this? I want to right. listen to this. And I would put it on and just like Elton John record and just being like looking at the record and sifting through and reading the lyrics and not, you know, not ever thinking like I would like Elton John or Bob Dylan when I was like a kid, but the packaging and the record covers were what like hooked me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I still do it. Um, not like I used to, like on a much smaller scale. So the label started when it started a while back. Yeah, started in. Well, it started first. It started in '97. I started this. Um, actually, I think I have the first record because I brought. I have this turntable, so I was bringing records here the other day. Um, it started in '97 with this really bad, well, badly designed but amazing record. Um, Called this is a band called Ananda, like really aggressive French hardcore, um, and that was in '97. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know how to put a record out. I had no clue. Um, I had friends who had done labels, and uh, there was a zine uh, that basically told you how to put a record out, like how to supply the artwork how much to pay, how, you know, uh, what you, how you, how you send them masters, whether if it's on tape or whatever. What scene was it? Um, Do you remember? Yeah, there, it, well, one was, it, there was an issue of um, heart attack, and one was, um, gosh, how can I forget it? It was uh, um, the Simple Machines, uh, uh, how can I forget it? It'll come to me. But in there, like that really, like I really figured out what I had to do, and I was like, oh, putting on a record's not that hard if you just can save up the money. Like right. it doesn't, it's not that difficult. And so that was in '97. Then from then, I changed the label name to Handheld Heart and did started doing like more seven inches and you know low run or twelve inches, but right. um, and did it for a long time. But I was never really interested in like it being like a label that puts out just records or puts out like the latest band's full length record, right. you know? I, I just was not interested in it being like just a record label. Right. Um, so I, I was, became more interested in it, uh, like putting out limited edition seven inches that were like counterparts to like another label putting out the full length or spending a little bit more time in money on it as like an object, you right. know, that people would sort of fetishize about or like feel like they were getting more than just buying a record. Uh, so it, that was sort of it from the early stages. You were art director there, right? Yeah. In a way, I mean, it was more like institute designer, you know, design director. Right. Just doing, you know, juggling projects, day-to-day -day design projects, but also juggling, like, you know, long-term book projects. How did that go? All graphic design, though. Was that just out of, straight out, out of school you started doing that? Kind of. It was a very hit-the-ground-running type of thing. It was, 
right out of school, like the, the I think I was maybe not even a week out of school, mm -hmm. I started working at this uh, ad agency in Culver City, and I worked there for four months, three months. But it was a type of job where you know we would make stuff all day, work fucking our asses off till like two in the morning, but no, nothing, nothing ever got made. It was kind of like continuously like thinking of ideas, mocking things up, presenting it, and being like, oh, that's great. Now we're gonna move on to this. And I'm not. That's not not part of my process. Like right. I had no relationship to the content. I didn't know who I was designing it for. I knew it was for like, yeah, it was for Motorola, right. but like that doesn't mean anything. So, I lasted like four months, and everyone I worked with was great, but I guess it was not like the sort of work that I wanted to be making. Um, so four months, uh, I was there four months, and then I got offered the job at Cyark. I got an email offering, them offering me this job, and I actually turned it down. I was like, oh, you know, I don't, I don't think so, I think I'm going to stay here. and. About a week went by, and I was like, "Why? Uh, why? What was I thinking? Like, <laughs> what was the point of me not? Like, that's an amazing opportunity. Like, that's exactly the job I want right now." Yeah. And so then I emailed them back and was like, "Does the offer still stand? Are you guys still looking?" And they're like, "Yeah, actually, come in." And then so I came in and started like a week later. Um, so it was really quick, mm -hmm. but the last day at my advertising job, mm -hmm. the last, my very last day there was my first day at Cyark. <laughs> so it's like I had a going away um, party, cake party at the ad agency to a wel welcoming pizza party, like an hour apart. That's so it, it was that's like full of cake and then I had to eat pizza. <laughs> so for myself, I being like a, you know, not exclusively print designer, but most of the work I do, catalogs, books, album packaging is exclusively print. Uh, I still always am trying to think about the marriage between how it's gonna exist on screen only mm -hmm. and how it's gonna exist like in your hand. Like how could that technology of on screen experience relate to how it, you know, exists in print? I'm more interested in sort of software and programming and writing code that can eventually like influence what the print product is. Mm -hmm. You know, so like writing code, programming, having a machine do some work that a, a human could do for print. So. Um, for the collage culture book that uh, um, is going to come out that I worked on with Mandy Kahn and Aaron Rose and programmer Chandler McWilliams. Mm -hmm. We, uh, Chandler and I, um, well Chandler coded it, but it's this idea where um, came up with um, a handful of rules, like a list of 25 compositional rules for creating collages. Okay. Whether if it's like how much white space there is, how much image there is, how the images are composed, do they touch each other, do they overlap, um, what shape are they, you know, a handful of rules and what um, the software does is it reads those rules, scours the internet, gathers content, unknowing to no relationship to the content, it's just free creative commons, like open source right. imagery. And it chooses those rules and makes an image. So it's, it's about, and then the final product is like a printed, you know, make a collage but right. it doesn't have a machine aesthetic it's mm -hmm. purely it looks like it's done by hand but it's it's using software and like online and technology to make to influence something that is eventually going to be printed it's the what's real and what's fake. Like some of the stuff is real right. and some of it is not. Is this one real? Wait. None of it's real. None of, not that this isn't real? No.